Hi, I'm Adam McDowell, reporting for the National Post. I'm here in Toronto talking with Ronald Wright about his new book, What is America? A Short History of the New World Order. You've called, in, in this and uh, previous books of yours, you've referred to the past 500 years as the Columbian Age. Yeah. Um, what, what is that concept? I mean, what, what's that term? Well, that, that's, what I, that's what I'm getting at when I say the new world made the modern world. That um, If you think about it, uh, before the Spanish conquests of Mexico and Peru, there were only 400 million people in the world. Uh, we now have about 17 times that number. And uh, Europe was desperately poor and backward, I mean, compared to the most advanced country in the world at that time was China. And all of that changed as a result of, first of all, the transfer of vast quantities of gold and silver to Europe, which flowed into Spain but didn't really stay there because the, the Spaniards squandered it all on warfare and empire building. And so the, the money gravitated north and both Adam Smith and Karl Marx noted the, the way that uh, New World bullion became the startup capital for the Industrial Revolution. But then even more importantly, uh, the New World civilizations had developed extremely productive crops. The potato, corn, sweet potato, manioc, many other things. But those big staples were more productive than the plants in the old world in general and also could thrive in, in a greater range of environments. So that led directly to the population boom. If we're living in the Columbian age, why isn't that generally recognized? The reason I think it's important to recognize the Columbian Age is that the last, this half millennium, this, these five centuries of boom times for the human race, both in numbers and in prosperity, uh, are, not, are, are an extraordinary thing that has only happened once in history and can't be repeated. So by recognizing the processes that brought us to where we are now as this uh, Columbian Age boom, perhaps will help us understand how we can proceed on a more sustainable basis from here on because the world isn't getting any bigger, uh, but it is getting a lot more crowded and the resources are getting scarcer and we are heading towards a food crisis. Going back to the beginning, when Europeans arrived in the Americas, why didn't they play nice? I mean, why, why didn't they make friends with the people who were already, already living here? Well, in some cases they did, but uh, the first Europeans to arrive in any large numbers were the Spaniards, and I don't think they really had any intention of making nice. Um, they wanted to, uh, they were looking for Asia, and they came over heavily armed. So obviously they were, they had the intent of plundering China and Japan, and perhaps establishing trading as well. Um, to their great good fortune, they discovered two of the world's biggest empires at the time, those of Mexico and Peru. Uh, and very soon after the Spaniards reached these countries, um, the population began to collapse from smallpox, which was inadvertently introduced by the Spaniards. Something that everyone forgets, actually, is the Aztecs beat the Spaniards the first time. The, uh, the first Spanish invasion was turned back by the Aztecs, and most of the Spaniards were killed, and most of their native allies, who foes of the Aztecs who who'd sided with them, were also defeated. But then smallpox got out and completely transformed the balance of power. So then the Spaniards realized that they could do better than just sort of plundering like Vikings, uh, that they could actually take over these, these places because the, uh, the native leadership was wiped out by smallpox. The population was, fell by at least half in one stroke. And so in, in a matter of a decade or two, they were able to put themselves at the top of these these social pyramids in Mexico and Peru, and um, extract the wealth and, 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 and use what was left of the population, because despite uh, losses of over 90%, there were still at least a million people, give or take, in each place when, that, when it reached the bottom, the population reached its bottom. It went down from about you know, 20 million in each of those empires down to roughly a million in in two or three generations so so it was, that's how europeans were able to take over the new world so easily and smallpox um sort of won the race i mean smallpox got to the southeastern u.s was down to the eastern u.s before europeans did yes when Hernando de soto uh invaded the southeastern united states in 1539 uh, and they, they eventually reached large towns, uh, and we're not talking about 
you know, villages of huts. We're talk, talking about towns that had big earthen pyramids in the middle with the chiefs living on the top and, and hundreds of houses. Um, but many of these towns were deserted or half empty, uh, grass growing up in the streets, huge piles of the dead stacked up like firewood because the plagues had got there just ahead of the Spaniards. And in fact, of course, the same was, as I mentioned in Mexico, the Spaniards actually didn't conquer anybody big until after smallpox. The Aztecs beat them the first time, then smallpox comes, then the Spaniards succeed. And then in Peru, which was a few years after Mexico, Pizarro didn't even attempt to conquer the, Inca, the Incas until after smallpox had, had got there as well. Looking back up at what became the U.S. again, um, you, you spend a, a fair bit of the book sort of debunking this myth that it was these kind of semi-primitive nomadic tribes. Um, how did that how did that myth get created? That myth gets started really early because the Pilgrim Fathers, who were one of the two early settle early British settlements, the Pilgrim Fathers land uh, uh, on the coast of Massachusetts, and uh, in their own account of what they did, they say that when we got here, it was just a wilderness. There were there were no houses, no towns. Um, uh, we were hungry, there was nothing here at all, and the only thing that made us survive and prosper was the Spirit of God. Uh, in actual fact, what happened was the pilgrims had uh, stopped at Cape Cod and they had heard that quite a substantial town of a people called the Wampanoags, uh, called, and the town was called Patuxet, had recently been depopulated by smallpox. And they heard that there, was a, there were ho empty houses, uh, large stocks of winter corn, and fields ready for planting. And so they went to Patuxet and changed the name to Plymouth, moved in and took over, survived on the, on the, winter, uh, the winter stores and then planted the fields in the spring. And then later that, that year, uh, uh, some of the surviving Wampanoags who had their own political problems with their neighbors made friends with the English and taught them how to grow corn and other American crops and also gave them the festival of Thanksgiving but the pilgrims didn't give thanks to the Indians, uh, but to their to their God who'd saved them in a wilderness, where in fact everything they ate at the Thanksgiving feast was the result of thousands of years of of uh, crop breeding by Native American civilizations. What was the Cherokee Nation, and and what happened to it? What happened there was that uh, the Cherokees were actually among a, a group of southeastern peoples descended from the ones who Hernando de Soto had visited in the 1540s. And these were highly developed societies with hierarchical structures, um, big towns and so forth. Uh, and the American settlers, the white settlers, called them the five civilized tribes. Uh, uh, they included the Creeks, uh, the Seminoles, uh, the Choctaws, but the, the most important and the, uh, was the Cherokee Nation. The, and, and the, the Americans fought a number of wars with the Cherokees. First of all, the British did, and then the American settlers. And, but eventually they realized, the young republic realized that it did not have the resources to conquer and dispossess all the, the more organized of, and, and larger scale of the Eastern Indian societies. So they, Thomas Jefferson held out the possibility. He said, look, the problem with conflict between us and you is that you're not civilized. But if you become civilized like us, then we can live side by side and we can intermarry, we can, uh, or you can maintain your own independent countries separate from the United States. Uh, and so the Cherokees and the other civilized tribes, so-called, took up that offer and became civilized in the European model. They adopted Euro-American technology, they adopted plows, uh, uh, they, they had a mounted police force, they had constitutions, uh, the Cherokees had a bilingual newspaper in their own language and in English. They invented a script for their own language and actually achieved a higher rate of literacy than the United States as a whole. But far from being allowed to remain as an independent nation, the, ver the very fact of the progress uh, along the, the lines that the Americans wished to see uh, doomed these people because the, the settlers saw a ready-made modern a state that they could take over. The Cherokee Nation could be taken over lock, stock and barrel. All they had to do was remove the Cherokees themselves. And in 1830, when President Andrew Jackson was elected, that's exactly what he did. He was elected on a platform to remove all the Indians east of the Mississippi and drive them west 
into what was then considered land unsuitable for whites. It was the, the first and possibly worst, probably the worst, uh, case of ethnic cleansing ever carried out by a democracy. And, and, and these Indians, in spite of the fact that their, their right to exist as sovereign peoples was upheld by the Supreme Court. Jackson rammed through the Indian Removal Act, rounded them all up at gunpoint, put them in internment camps where many of them died, and then marched them uh, on a death march called the Trail of Tears uh, until they were expelled from the lands the whites wanted.